We're ready to commence our afternoon session, and I just want to make a follow-up comment on our little skit program that we had right before lunch. I think it did a good job of illustrating why in cases that come to our board or go to court, there's a lot of shades of gray. Sometimes it's real clear it's one way or the other, but a lot of times there's shades of gray on what happened or not, what the law might apply, and then finally you've got the big question of does the punishment fit what happened or not. The next area we deliberately kind of stage it after lunch because we know that food's settling in. And uh, the good news is we've got a superstar topic called social media that never bores people and is never the same year after year. And we've got a rock star speaker ready to uh, go. But he couldn't touch on here. <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell, Mark is not shy. And he's going to have the roaming microphone, so if you're going to try and get an afternoon nap, he'll probably perch at your table and wake you up. So, But before he starts, I just wanted to make two little quick points to share. People forget that public employees do have First Amendment rights. Some people in the private sector might not have as much, and some companies or businesses will say social media is a no-no. Some say we really want you to, but public employees do have certain rights, but it's not as clear as that. And you'll be shocked to learn we were on our board when we had a couple cases that came down the line that the, the key case goes back to 1968. Some of you weren't even born then, but it was the U.S. Supreme Court 54 years ago, Pickering versus Board of Education, uh, a 9 or 8 1 decision that Thurgood Marshall authored and Earl Warren, a real name out of the past, was a party to. And they decided that a school teacher could uh, say the school board was doing something dumb with tax money. And he lost and lost, but the U.S. Supreme Court said not so fast. And that's one of the key decisions. He might also mention a Garcia case, which is a little bit in question whether it means as much as Pickering. But the good thing is this topic is never boring. It's always changing. And we're so lucky to have back again Mark Fischel, who's a real-life city attorney, a real-life practicer of law, who deals with these issues and follows up on all the cases. So, Mark, it's all yours, and you got the right to roam around. And no, get... I don't. I've been told I can only go this far and this far because of the camera. Oh, that's right. Okay, good. <laughs> well, everybody's got rules, but it's now so more official. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. So, good afternoon. I appreciate that uh, we... That, that, that Justin pissed one of the heavier meals possible for lunch right before I'm speaking, but that's okay, it's all good. Um, so I, I do wanna try to make this as interactive as possible, so please, if you have questions, comments, there's gonna be a couple slides where I'm really gonna ask for your participation. Um, you know, I, my experience has been that we can learn from each other as much as better probably than me just sitting here and droning on for an hour and a half. So we are gonna walk our way through some social media stuff. We're gonna talk about some of the First Amendment issues, some of the practical issues, um, and you know, discipline issues uh, as, as we address them. But again, there are a lot of gray areas, um, as the chairman just said. So no, there's not a one-size-fits-all kind of presentation. And it can't be. So I just I just want you to folks to keep that in mind. And when you have a question, and if you want to say I have a friend who has a question who might have this issue hypothetically, that's fine too. So um, first of all, just you know, we all know the ubiquity of social media. I don't need a raise of hands. I don't need you to tell me. But just think about it. You've been at a conference this morning, and look, I'm guilty of it too. I'm not excluded. How many how many minutes? Let's talk minutes, not hours. Did you spend on social media already this morning when we're sitting here supposed to be good students? Again, I do it all the time. I'm not, I'm not here to criticize anybody, but it's just there and it's easier and easier to be there and it's easier and easier for people to be stupid. And that really, because God knows, you know, it's bad enough I got to look at what you ate for lunch in a picture. That's not, at least that's not going to get you in trouble. But now I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel in response to what President Biden said or what Governor DeWine said or what my idiot supervisor told me today. And I'm going to tell the world. And we could do it really quickly. And it's not smart. I mean, you know, you, you think back when 
email was being, yes, and I, there are some people, including me, who remember pre-email, um, and email was like, okay, you can send things way too immediately. Write that email and either and think about it or write it and delete it to get it out of your system. And now just think how much easier it is to do all this stuff that may not be in one's best interest. So we're going to talk about what's changed and what's not. I mean, you know, a lot of things haven't changed. What has changed is how much easier it is and how much hard to do social media stuff and how much harder it is for us as employers to, or whoever to keep up with what's out there. Um, so, you know, there is, we, we've got the, um, you know, so here we're going to talk a little bit about social media platforms and networks just for a minute or two. First Amendment issues, Fourth Amendment issues, and again, as government employers, you have a lot different, um, have to take a much different approach than private employers would um, who are, who are um, um, dealing with these issues because you don't have to worry about the First Amendment or the Fourth Amendment um, or due process or some things like that as a private employer. We'll talk a little bit about personnel policies, on-duty and off-duty conduct, um, your own social media as an employer, um, as a government entity, do you operate social media and some things to be careful about if you choose to do that? And we'll talk, the discipline's listed there, but we're gonna, it'll be interspersed with our conversations. So here are what I consider to be some of the more common social media platforms. And I think I know all of them except for Be Real. I had to look that one up. So I've heard of all the other ones, and it's my understanding too that on some of these that you could do some bad things on it too. You know, in a, you know, like there's Reddits and subreddits and things that we shouldn't be reading. I'm pretty sure. I've been told that WhatsApp is uh, is something that if you, in, used in a certain way might be used by bad people from time to time. But again, these are common things. What is that? These are all real things. I'm not making this up. Um, you know, there, wait, I, I wrote down what a couple of them might be. Um, oh, be, be Real, which was on the other list, that is a randomly selected two minute video every day that I think you can post, or I didn't get into it in that much detail. Um, let's see, there's a, another one on here, um, Alpha. This is going to help people succeed at work. Oh yeah, that's that that's that it's going to again, I didn't go on these sites. I was kind of nervous to do so. Um, but you know, what the heck is Alpha? It's going to help me. Um, let's see. Crunchyroll has to do with anime. Open Diary. This is a good one because the description is phenomenal. Open Diary is available to help respect and support each other through life's ups and downs. You imagine somebody, I mean, I think there's probably more than one person who's posted on there as about a problem they might really have, which again, that's their business. Sometimes I don't understand why people share things they share. Um, but, and then a bunch of people saying, get over it. That's not helping me with life's ups and downs. But you know this stuff is out there. Now there is one, I don't know if it still exists, but I talked about it when I spoke on this topic years ago called Run P. Does anybody know what that is? So it's not anything gross. Well, maybe, but so the, the, I don't know if it's a social media app, but I've used it on the list because I thought it was funny and if it still exists. It tells you the best time to go to the bathroom during a movie in a movie theater. So that might be not a bit, that might be useful. Um, and then there was one, and I wish I remember the name of it, but it was where men who are into My Little Pony connected. So, yeah, so again, my point is though, there's so many opportunities for people to use social media. And again, if they want to go on Alpha or Flip or Wattpad, more power to them. But what are they saying on those things? And the other thing I will say to you in this regard is, I don't know from a technology standpoint, you know, I know how to get Facebook. I know how to access or find somebody to help me access a TikTok video or whatever. On some of these things, who knows how, how you might ever or never find out about what's going on. You know, it's not like you're gonna 
sit down with a new applicant and say, or an applicant and say, do you have, here's a list, do you have any of these social media? You're not gonna do that, nor should you. So my point is, it is a challenge. It absolutely is a challenge, and it will continue to be a challenge. Um, and in part, it is a challenge because of the First Amendment. One of the things that you folks have to deal with, as, again, as I said before, is that is the First Amendment. Government shall pass no law that. A lot of times you see people bitching on mostly Twitter. Oh, Twitter banned me or won't let so-and-so on. That's a violation of my first... No, it's not. Government shall not, which means you folks. Um, so even those of you who represent unions, um, I mean, unions aren't bound by the First Amendment because they're not a government entity. Um, but so... The case from 1968 that was that was just mentioned a minute ago is still good law, even though things have changed a lot since 1968 regarding not just technology, but of course how we, uh, what our what our tolerances and expectations are regarding public speech. So before 1968, basically, if you are a public employee, in this case involved a school teacher who went to the local school board where he also worked and lived and complained about how they were spending money. And he got fired. Now today, we would never assume that that would, is OK. But in 1968, things were a lot different. Um, so what the Supreme Court said is that just because you're a public employee, you don't, and this, is, of course, is off-duty comments. It could apply to on-duty as well. But ju just because you're a public employee doesn't mean you lose your right to um, uh, engage in free speech, First Amendment activities. But we recognize that there is a limit to that because the government is also an employer, and an employer has certain ex reasonable expectations, um, not just of their employees, but reasonable expectations imposed upon them. This is really hard to stand here. And then stand here. Reasonable expectations. Um, imposed on them by taxpayers, too. So, you know, if you have somebody who can't do their job because they hold opinions that are inconsistent with their position, that's something that in public employers should be allowed to address, address. So, in this particular case, what the Supreme Court said, and again, it's still good law, is that first, the first question is whether or not the employee is speaking on a matter of public concern, which is very broad. I'm not gonna try to, uh, define that for you. I'm not sure we can define that for you. I can tell you that there's another case, it's cited in your outline called Connick v. Myers, where a, the Supreme Court in 1983 said that the plaintiff in that case, who was a district attorney or assistant district attorney in New Orleans or Louisiana someplace, was, was, make, was posting, or not posting, of course, in 83, but was making comments um, and and trying to fire people up because their workload was too heavy. And the court said that was a personal grievance. That's not even a matter of public concern. So since that person wasn't just talking on a matter of public concern, then there's no free speech right. Um, we don't even get to the balancing test. Um, so first of all, so a matter of public concern. How, your, how, my tax, how my school board's spending taxpayer dollars? Clearly a matter of public concern. And then the court said, now we have to balance the rights. The rights between the employee who's engaging in free speech and the needs and rights are obligations of the employer who has to you know, efficiency in public service. This case, it was kind of a no-brainer because the em employer didn't even try. They just fired the person for going in front of the school board and complaining about how money was being spent. So early on, after, you know, into the 70s, 80s, 90s even, most cases, if you got to the public concern point, it was gonna be really hard for the government to prevail and say, our needs outweigh your First Amendment rights. So therefore, um, you know, the, the cases almost, all, all, almost always came out in favor of the employee. Since that time, the court ha courts have been, I think, looking at a more, pardon the overuse of the word, balanced approach, and it is not out of quest the question that an employee, or a public employer can discipline somebody for stuff they say in public from a First Amendment standpoint. Now, let me make this clear 
First Amendment is one consideration when we're talking about social media and posts and things like that. But of course, it's not the only consideration. We have, um, you know, you have people who are posting stuff that is evidence is their fact that they are abusing sick leave. You don't have to worry about the First Amendment there for the most part. Or other examples of misconduct that don't even implicate the First Amendment. And we'll talk about some of those here in a little bit. And then there are some, and unfortunately, we're seeing more of this. I mean, you know, again, because it's easier to go on social media and do this, where clearly somebody may be talking about a matter of public concern, but because of their views that they have shared, they are now, there's no way they can continue to work for this organization. And for, a pu for public employers, it's going to be incumbent upon you to present evidence at an arbitration hearing or an SPBR hearing or in court with a First Amendment lawsuit that addresses the needs of the public employer and why it is that this person was terminated, even though they may have said something off duty. Um, so, that, and that, those are some of the challenges that you're going to have to face and deal with, and I think you all recognize that. But again, the point is, these cases are the, the case law that applies to pre um, pre uh, social media, pre internet. Um, they, and it still provides us the same guidance. So there's a couple of cases I just want to quickly discuss in your outline. And again, if anybody has any uh, questions, please, please feel free to stop me. Um, so um, this Shepard versus McGee case, and again, I've just picked out a few cases here that I think help illustrate this point in a more practical, hopefully in a more practical way. Um, so in this case, um, you had a plaintiff who was a child protective caseworker for a state human services department, and she was a responsible for investigating allegations of abuse and neglect. Um, and guess what? Her experiences on her job made her jaded with the courts, how the court system worked. Wow, what a revelation. Of course, then she had to share it. Um, with the world. Um, so she, um, <clears throat> she made comments, numerous social media posts where she accused clients of generally having luxury items and not paying taxes and recommending birth control and sterilization to prevent those on public assistance from having additional children. Um, again, th all of those comments, as offensive as they might be, are protected by the First Amendment and arguably are a matter of public concern. Um, you know, it certainly wasn't a personal grievance, although it might have been both. Um, and she ended up getting terminated for her, from her position, filed a lawsuit and uh, based on First Amendment, and the employer prevailed. And again, the employer prevailed because when you look at the balancing test, it was not too difficult for the employer, oh, I thought I had the Pickering thing up there still, um, for the employer to say the needs of us as a public employer to do what is our mission outweigh her right to make these comments and it also evidences perhaps an inability for her to be trusted to do that job because she cannot go in and say, you know, a lot of times unfortunately you'll see these things based on race well, I'm gonna do everything I can for white people, but not for black people. Or I'm gonna do everything I can for somebody who appears to really be down on their luck, as opposed to somebody who's buying luxury items in, in, with their public assistance. So that is, I don't wanna say that was an easy case, but it's a relatively straightforward case because of the comments that she chose to make. Um, there, uh, here's another case. Um, this Bennett case involved a 911 dispatcher who, um, uh, after an unknown man commented on her post that she had made on social media, guess what? About the 2016 presidential election. She was the, might have been the only person who posted on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> and she got caught. Um, after, so after an unknown man commented on her post, she responded saying, thank God we have more American-loving rednecks. Okay, I mean, I don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, red spread across all America, okay. She finished her reply by remarking even that N-word, ending in A-Z, um, so not the N-word, but the N-word, um, and Latinos voted for Trump too. 
and then some coworkers made some comments and she removed the post. So let me just say this, first of all, and I, sh I know I don't have to say this to this group, but, I, but it amazes me that I have to say this at all. Just because you have friends who you, if you use the N-word doesn't mean you can use them or that employees get to use them. And the fact that you use an A at the end or an A-Z does not change it. And I, you know, you laugh, but I've had, I had a case involving a fire chief and he did a bunch of other things too, wrong, and this is years ago, and, and, and that was his, under oath, that's his testimony, it wasn't really the N-word, and other, they use it too. That, never a good excuse. <laughs> you're in trouble if you're going there, and should be. Um, so, um, so in this particular case, though, um, the, the employer also discovered that this employee identified her self as a dispatcher for this dispatch organization. And that's another factor to keep in mind when you're dealing with social, uh, social media stuff. Is the employee in any way identifiable as working or related to your organization? Again, it's not the be all and end all one way or the other, but it's another factor that makes it easier for the employer to say, hey, she identified her as a dispatch for the, in this case, ECC, I'm not sure what it stands for, um, and then, um, so of course people will look at that, No, she works for us, and if we don't do something about it, we might tolerate it. Um, and so she was terminated, filed a lawsuit, and the court, the district court actually initially ruled in her favor and said that the potential for harm is relatively slight because the post had nothing to do with her position, only one member of the public complained, and the post was unlikely to deter African-American individuals for using, uh, from using emergency services. And the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the Federal Court of Appeals that governs Ohio, reversed and said that um, the, the trial court's focus on the use of a racial epithet alone ignored the vicious history tied to the word um, and, the, um, and, and, and said that the court found that emergency dispatch required a high degree of teamwork that the tri trial court failed to take into account. And so the, the, the First Amendment lawsuit ultimately failed. Now contrast that with a case that goes back to a little earlier than that from a different court of appeals where an employee who was basically a phone answerer um, in a, in a uh, service department of, it might have been the city of Charlotte, but someplace in North Carolina, was also some grand poobah big shot with the KKK and was quoted in the paper about that stuff. And in that case, the employer tried to fire the employee and they lost. And the reason they lost, and again, this is older, so it might the outcome might be different. The reason they lost is because, again, as offensive as those comments are, the, you can, they're still protected by the First Amendment. And he wasn't advocating, again, he wasn't coming out and advocating violence. We could debate whether or not just his appearance as a KKK member um, advocates violence. But, and the court ultimately said because of his position, he's not, he doesn't work with the public other than answering calls. There's no evidence he had tried to treat minorities differently than white people calling. And there was no, the employer couldn't show the same impact on the, it, its ability to get the job done, which is why he prevailed in that case. Again, it's an older case, so it might come out differently just because of how things have, I'll use the word deteriorated when it comes to some of these things. And I don't mean deteriorated in a, well, it's all in a bad way, but um, it's that courts might, um, be more sympathetic to employers, even public employers who don't want people who espouse those views working for them. But again, there is a First Amendment issue here. And the First Amendment, even in that case, if that, if that guy was a police officer, no way he keeps his job. No way. Um, or some other you know, higher level decision making position. Unless, of course, he's an elected official and then it's okay. It, don't read anything into the comments I make. Um, <laughs> there, another case is up here, Kearney versus the city of Dothan, where, um, again, this uh, uh, police officer who was actually known in the community because she was 
uh, often was the spokesperson for this police department, um, was complaining about uh, the harsh treatment, in her opinion, other officers received because they engaged in inappropriate behavior towards yet other officers. Um, and um, the, um, in, in this case, again, it was another situation where the employee was fired. There were internal and external or citizen complaints, and the uh, court uh, uh, rejected the First Amendment claim because, again, the notoriety that this employee had, the fact that she was calling out, she was kind of defending bad cops. And again, I'm not saying, you know, we can all have our opinion of what is a bad cop or a bad social worker or whatever, but she was kind of going on a rampage inconsistent with, with where the facts had led a particular case um, and ended up losing her First Amendment claim. Um, again, keeping in mind, everything, all these things are on a case-by-case -case basis, um, which lawyers love because then, you know, you got to go to lawyers more and figure it out, and we have to fight about it and all those things. The, uh, the, before I talk about this Rank versus Fernandez case, I just want to make mention of whistleblowers. So we all know that the whistleblowers have protection under Ohio and on, under federal law, including Chapter 124 of the Revised Code. What, what I do not, and, and most of those whistleblower statutes have specific requirements that the alleged whistleblower has to meet in order to have protection under those statutes, uh, protection from retaliation. Generally speaking, and I say generally, posting something uh, that would be a whistleblower complaint on social media without giving it to my boss or without giving it to the proper agency that can address this is likely not to be sufficient to get somebody whistleblower protection. Although again, if you see it, you gotta do take some action. If you see an employee who, you know, you could be a whistleblower because of sexual harassment. Obviously, if you see somebody who's alleging sexual harassment uh, on social media but hasn't come to you, they still, you still gotta take action if you find out about that. And let me make this clear. You know, they're, they're, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes. You can't just go on to people's, you know, deceptively go on or order an employee to allow you onto their social media site. But if, so, if an employee comes to you and said, I just saw Mark posted, boom, get a copy of it. Ask that person right then and there to provide you a copy of it. You're entitled to it, um, and you should get it in your hands, whether it's something that you think is true or not, whether you get a copy of it. You're allowed to do that. Um, I get that question a lot, so I want to emphasize it. So this rank case, I just had a client yesterday tell me, oh, you come in and you know, know what you're doing, but you're always disorganized, and I disagreed with them, and here I am personified. Uh, so this, uh, yeah, yeah, where did I leave off here? I, you know, I should have had a notebook. Sorry. Just entertain you. Go, go on social media for a day. Oh my gosh, thank you. I was testing you. You passed. <laughs> I would have been never 15 minutes in that room. All right, so the rank case is important because there's some nuances that you need to be aware of when about employees who are engaged in First Amendment, potential First Amendment protected activities in the course and scope of their job duties. So the rank case involves a prosecutor who was suspended for posting a document questioning how his department handled an investigation. He posted it on a blog. And the prosecutor was removed from the investigation after informing homicide detectives that he, he could not say that the shooting of a suspect was justified based on the evidence in the case. And the prosecutor wrote a detailed memo in the context of his job explaining why it is that he felt this way. Um, and three years after the incident, made a public records request for a copy of that memo. Now again, I don't understand why it's not protected by attorney-client privilege and stuff, but we, we'll, we'll ignore that for a minute. And the prosecutor, that's when the prosecutor posted the memo on a blog. 
Um, and he was then suspended without pay for 30 days. And the reason for a suspension was very clearly because you posted this inform sensitive information on a blog. So the suspension was because of his speech. A lot of times that question's up in the air. No, the suspension is really because you're a crappy employee and this is how we know. No, it's because I complain, you know. So there's a lot of times factual disputes about that. Not in this case. And prosecutor filed a lawsuit alleging his suspension was in retaliation for exercising First Amendment. Um, and the, um, the prosecutor was able to, in this case, the court accepted that the prosecutor was dealing or addressing a matter of public concern because of the response to the blog postings. And it was, he did it as a citizen because he was concerned about, again, the outcome of that case or how that case was handled. Um, and a matter of public concern is, it's a, a, a statement is a matter of public, of con, con, ah, public concern if it is of interest to the community, whether for social, political, or other reasons. Um, and this was kind of wrongdoing that he was calling out. And he ended up prevailing, um, the, he ended up prevailing on his First Amendment cl claim. Now, it was dismissed for other reasons that aren't really relevant to our discussion. And the, the, the reason why I think this is important is because there are other cases, one from the United States Supreme Court that involved Garcetti was what the, the defendant, I, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on the plaintiff's name in that case. And in that particular case, the, uh, again, an assistant district attorney filed, a, was, was disciplined for going public with how his opinion about how a search warrant was executed. And he testified in court for the defense, and he wrote a memo similar to what happened in this Rank versus Fernandez case, and filed a First Amendment lawsuit and lost because the United States Supreme Court said he was speaking in his official capacity as an assistant district attorney, and therefore is not entitled to First Amendment protection in that capacity. I cannot find a legitimate difference, and that case predated the Rank versus Fernandez case. I cannot find, in my mind, a legitimate distinction between these two cases. Now, the court in the rank case said, well, he made a public records request of it. So what? I mean, that doesn't really make it, if it's otherwise was done in the scope of his job duties, why is it now all of a sudden public? Um, uh, you know, it, it, I believe that the Supreme Court, without overturning themselves in their prior decision, sort of scaled back the ramifications of what, what if, if, you, if you're making the comment in the context of your job, then you don't get First Amendment protection. I think that's way too broad. But I also want you to understand that it's a possible defense for public employers if you ever get in this kind of situation. I wouldn't rely only on that as a, no, we can still discipline you for what you said, um, but it's something to keep in mind. Here's the other thing to keep in mind. This is really important. I should have mentioned it right at the beginning. The First Amendment does not protect untruthful statements. It protects opinions, but it does not protect untruthful statements. Now, you, you as the employer will have to prove that it was untruthful if you want to discipline somebody for it, but employees can be disciplined for untruthful statements, whether they're made to the public or not, Again, assuming you can approve, prove that they're untruthful. My boss is never in the office. She is out every Friday afternoon, every Thursday morning, and almost every Wednesday. And it's just a lie. There's, that, that, that is, is it a matter of public concern? If true, sure. But it's not true, so therefore it does not get First Amendment protection. Again, we could debate for hours or years in the context of litigation whether something is true or not, but again, truthful state, untruthful statements are not protected by the First Amendment. Any questions, thoughts, comments? I have a question. Um, in, uh, One second. If the, dis oh. if the dispatcher wasn't identified on the social media page as a dispatcher, then could the employer still take the action to terminate? So I would say yes, 
but acknowledging that the fact that that employee was was um, associated with their, you know, employ that we could tell who the, her employer was certainly helps the employer. So, yes, I think they still could have taken the action to terminate because, again, the language that was used and the sentiments that were expressed arguably are inconsistent with being a dispatcher. Now, if they, it, otherwise, I pro, I, I, now, I, with the, that different fact, I might also have looked at a suspension um, and said, don't do it again, too. Although you still have a First Amendment claim, whether it's a suspension or a termination. And, and it was on the slur alone. It, it wasn't, so if she said black people and Latinos or It might African, have been different. Okay. It might have been different. Um, yeah, I mean, th there are things you, d you just can't do, and that's one of them. I think there was a hand back there. Uh, while I'm moving, um, I like to hit the like button a lot. How's that playing? Wait, what am I supposed to do? If I hit the like button on Facebook. Oh, if I hit the like button. I thought you were telling me. <laughs> That's a good, there's actually a case on that. I don't know if it's in the outline that says hitting a like button on Facebook is uh, arguably an exercise of your First Amendment rights. So I'd like the website of a candidate for a county commissioner or mayor. That's, that's First Amendment protected activity. Question I had was, um, are classified employees are significantly limited on what they could do from a partisan political activity? So at that intersection um, and in our hyper-partisan climate, does that extend to issues rather than just individuals or candidates to where it limits some of that speech on, on that end? So from a part, so, Classified employees can be restricted, again, you should have a policy that tells them this, it, from engaging in certain partisan political activity. In my opinion, it does not extend to issues, and in my opinion, it does not, it, no, and it clearly doesn't extend to um, opinions about a candidate. Now, again, if you use certain language, you might get in trouble for, you know, like we've been discussing here. But basically, a, a, a classified civil service employee cannot engage in partisan political activity, which incl may include running for partisan office, soliciting money for a candidate for partisan office. Um, those are the two biggies. There's a, actually a list in the administrative code um, that is, uh, provides, I think, a good, good background of that. But no, I think the, the hyper-political saying that the election was stolen, no it wasn't, does not violate a, a uh, prohibition against engaging in partisan political activity because there are things we still can do and we don't relinquish as classified civil service employees, including supporting a candidate, we can give money to the candidate, we can express our views on Facebook about a candidate. Anything else? Okay, it's like an auction. If you make a sudden movement, I'm gonna call on you. Yes. I wanna take the Bennett case just a little further in of, I see it increasingly with teachers, uh, law enforcement, that they try to um, change the noun recurves of their name so that it's a little less trackable and don't associate with their full name. And sometimes they don't even have images that would, you know if they're a friend of somebody, you see them, but you, they try to disguise themselves within Facebook. So have you seen any case law of diving in and uh, trying to associate with that person? And I think it has the distinction of if they say where they work, that definitely you know gives them ownership. But when they try to hide whom they are, how does that reach? Yeah, so I have not seen cases like that. Um, but the way I think I would envision that coming up is from a factual standpoint, A, is this a comment being made by one of our employees? And B, is it, does it violate any of our rules? Now, in part of that A, B, and in between A and B, there might be other ways that you can figure out that everybody knows that that's, that it, it's Archme Ischelfe, because I use Pig Latin. I'm a fluent Pig Latin speaker. Um, and um, so I think a lot of it's factual, factual dependent, but again, 
the mere fact that I don't I don't make it clear where I work still doesn't necessarily get me out of trouble. If I put on Facebook, I mean, so I, if I put on Facebook that I had a case several years ago where a, a, a police officer put on Facebook an incredibly offensive, just shared, it wasn't her own, which is enough, uh, offensive um, um, cartoon about police uh, making fun of claims of police brutality against black people, it was caricatured, it was so awful. That person, in that case, I'm, you know, I'm making up facts here because in that case, the person did say she was an employee of a particular law enforcement agency, but if she hadn't, and I, and I, I could still, I think that's still absolute disciplinable case because you can't, you can't show that kind of bias to the public and also, impartially enforce the law. So I'm not, at, so the short answer is I haven't seen a case like that. The longer answer is that I don't, it may not matter depending on your facts. Any other hands or stuff? Okay, so actually I have a little bit of a hypothetical here, a case where a teacher was terminated. Oh, I meant to say, I meant to hide what happened to him. But, so this teacher's terminated after his middle school, middle school students discovered his TikTok account. Never, not, nothing ever good comes after discovered his TikTok, TikTok account, <laughs> which included videos of the teacher drinking. Okay, well, that's not a big deal. In these videos, the teacher was cursing and joking that it was before school, and he needed a drink to deal with these idiots that he worked with. I mean, this guy ended up getting fired. <laughs> You know, again, he might have been kidding around, but in this day and age, you can't, you know, I'm not want to be a, I don't want to be the, you know, the, the, the you know, de I'm not delicate when it comes to this stuff, but that's just not smart stuff. And again, I don't know all the other nuances because, you know, you never see that in these cases. Um, another video included the teacher in a candlelit bathtub where he made a lip sync, either lip sync or made crude sexual comments. I'm not sure that's enough to fire the guy. I mean, you know, if it's on his own time, but, but saying I need a drink because I'm dealing with a bunch of idiots, meaning the kids, that's, that's gonna get you in trouble. But here's another case that, here, here's another one. This is a little PG-13, so I apologize. But teacher goes, oh, during the summer, to goes to some music festival, and this actually happened. I don't know what the outcome was, but, um, and there is an opportunity to drink a shot from an iced sized man with a phallus, you know, so it's gonna slide. Don't picture it. And somebody else took a picture of her and posted it on social media. And I believe she ended up losing her job. Now, that's not a First Amendment case or anything like that, but I find that to be, oh, we're switching. Why is that, what is your address? Oh, was it going to, oh, so loud, I can't tell. Um, but, but I mean, I, you know, to me, that seems inherently inappropriate and unfair to terminate that teacher in that kind of situation, even if some kids or parents saw that. Um, but there are practical realities as well, so, you know. But so, you know, it's a little different. And you can see when you take the facts a little bit differently, again, not a, not a First Amendment situation, but certainly a situation where how does it hinder that person's ability to do their job? Calling your kids idiots and even kidding around that you have to drink. You know, back in my day, when the ninth grade math teacher was drunk, nobody cared. <laughs> and that is an absolute true story. Maybe that's why I didn't, I'm so bad at math. Yeah, that's it. Uh, things are a lot different in some ways, many, many ways for the better. Um, so I'm going to move on from First Amendment issues and now talk about Fourth Amendment issues. Because one of the tricky things is how do you stop somebody and or find out if they've been using social media? So again, unlike private employers, you have the Fourth Amendment to worry about in the Constitution, which says, protects all of us, including public employees, from unreasonable searches and seizures, which generally means prohibits employers from searching through an employee's personal belongings. 
So let's break that down a little bit in the context of social media and the ways we get on social media. So number one, and I'm guessing that 98% of you have this policy, and for the 2% who don't, just pretend you do, um, that says that when you're using our devices, you have no expectation of privacy, and computers, cell phones, iPads, any of that stuff, and, and that will certainly be upheld under the Fourth Amendment. So that would not be an unlawful search for you to even randomly say, Mark, I'm gonna look at your cell phone, your, your search history right now, or do it without even me knowing it. Um, but your policy, policy should make that cl as clear as possible. Um, because the first question is whether the employee had a reasonable expectation of privacy. And the reasonable expectation of privacy includes not just what the employer is um, wanting to look at, but also includes the, um, the context. So if I, if I work in a corrections facility, I know everything on me is subject to a search. If I'm working in an office setting and I'm carrying a purse, you can't just go into my purse without some reasonable suspicion to look in that. Um, so again, a desk is probably fair game um, in an office setting, but that's, that's the first question that you should be thinking about is, all right, where are we in terms of our employees' use of social media in this regard? So, and, and so actually the question really isn't just use of social media, it's how do we allow our employees to use or prohibit them from using our stuff? So computers are the easiest because almost everybody in this room who has employees who use computers, you're providing that computer. But again, you should make it clear to the employee, and we'll talk about some policies here and some things you can put in policies later on, that that is, that we're gonna, we're gonna look at that and we can look at it anytime we want. Now, again, I don't need a show of hands, but I'm guessing that several people, several, many folks in here also allow employees a limited amount of personal use on their computer, as long as it is, doesn't take up a lot of time, mostly. Now again, of course, you're prohibiting them going to porn sites and gambling sites and that kind of stuff. But that's another, actually that dovetails back to the First Amendment. Where do you draw the line, and how do you draw the line if you're allowing me to go to a, um, well, let's pretend it's last year. What if you're allowing me to uh, people to go to a sports site and I'm going to the Cleveland Indians site and there's somebody who is legitimately offended by seeing that Chief Wahoo thing up? Is that terrible? Probably not. Is that going to you know, get anybody in trouble? No. But you can see how this this it, uh, kind of the slippery slope. So I let you go on uh, and do some stuff. I had case many, many years ago. Again, I think it's easier now because how offensive it is, but they allowed employees on their lunch hour to do, to look at, um, you know, again, not the, the usual, you know, CNN, whatever it is. Uh, and the, one particular employee's husband was some big shot with the KKK. So she went on some sites that, again, I don't, I don't know the, what the content was themselves, but I'll tell you, I'm walking by someone's computer at work, I don't wanna see a big KKK, no matter what it says underneath it. Um, and the, the issue there became, can we say no to that? I think probably, but you know, can you say no to, you know, here's another one, and again, I'm not trying to be political here, but you know, you, you let somebody go on an LBGTQ web, website, and now are you gonna, allow uh, that coworker to go on the anti-LBGTQ website? Again, I'm not say, trying to give you the answers to these questions, I'm just uh, pointing out that if you're allowing people to do this stuff while they're at work on, on your device, that there, is, there are going to be potential consequences for that. And it would be great if it was just as simple as saying, use your judgment. <laughs> ah. if, if people use good judgment, I'd be out of a job. And you HR folks would too. All right, so do you know where I put my outline now? I 
Thank you. Wow, that is, I'm not kidding around. I didn't remember. That's terrible. Um, so, um, so here, I mean, you know, there's a case here, there's a, uh, a case in your outline that I just wanted to mention here because, again, the other idea, the other issue of, that you have to be aware of regarding the Fourth Amendment is the idea that, um, you know, some stuff, oh, I'm, I'm too far, I wasn't thinking, <laughs> is there's some stuff that you have to make sure that you are, um, you know, that any of us can see, and that's fine, and there's some stuff that is kept private by choice, and you have more of a right to have access to things and, you, and, and use things from a disciplinary standpoint if it's made public. Now again, if it's private and it's shared with somebody and that somebody is one of your employees or a citizen, you can say, hey, provide, give me a copy of it, and that's totally fair game. Um, but just because it's public doesn't mean you should do stuff with it. There's a case in your outline that I find really bothersome from an employment standpoint. It's this uh, Cheney versus Fayette Pu County Public School District. This is a Fourth Amendment case and a right to privacy case. I, I mean, if this, if the teacher in the bathtub should w should have been fired, this teacher should have been fired. So a 17-year-old student sued her high school or her school district because the IT director used a Facebook picture of her in a bikini standing next to a cutout of um, a rapper. And he used it in a PowerPoint presentation called Internet Safety. And again, the student alleged that the IT person violated her right to privacy, and the court ruled against the 17-year-old because it was a public post. But that doesn't mean we should take that public post and use it in a context like that. And see, that's the other problem with some of this stuff here, is that just because it's public doesn't mean that we want it spread around, especially when you're dealing with a 17-year-old. I don't know. That one, that one really kind of stuck out to me. Any questions, comments? Come on, people. Um, all right, so, um, so, the, so then the next question, I think, becomes when you, with regard to, oh, I do like this case on, it's page seven of my outline. I, don't, I know you have different page numbers too, but this United States versus Simons who, <laughs> hey, you can't go on my computer and find my porn and fire me just because I work for the CIA. And <laughs> oh my God, how does this case even get to court? It's just a lawyer, lawyers will take any case. It's terrible. Um, so, the mere fact, though, that something is protected by the Fourth Amendment is also balanced against the employer, I'm sorry, the government's right to know. Because the Fourth Amendment says there shall not be any unreasonable search, searches or seizures. So a lot of times, a search is conducted through the use of a search warrant. There is something I read recently in the paper about a search warrant. I can't remember. But the, um, so again, but a lot of searches occur without a search warrant, and that's fine. And again, even in a non-law non enforcement context, you might do a search because you have reason to believe that your employee took confidential information and put it out there for the world to see, or something like that. So you might have an opportunity uh, or the right to search somebody's even personal electronic devices. What I would say to you, though, is if you're ever in that position, be very, very careful and tiptoe because there are super limitations, as well there should be, for you as a government employer to just say, give it to me, give me your password, I'm going to look. And you got to make sure that if you're in that situation, that you keep the uh, search very limited to what you legitimately might need to know. And again, there's a case coming up here that would help illustrate that. But the, what, the other thing I would say to you, though, is if it's a phone or a, a, another device, especially if it's a, you're a law enforcement agency and it's the person's personal phone, I, I still think you have the right to get your hands on it and hold it, even though you may not have the right to run and look into at it. So in other words, to preserve evidence, but again, you really got to be t talking to legal counsel if you're getting to that point. Um, so here's something else. Please, please, please keep this in mind. 
Don't get information on, from social media indirectly that you can't get directly. And what I mean by that is don't impersonate someone and to try to find out stuff about an employee that that when you're doing an investigation, um, don't you know? Don't ask somebody else to give you access. As an employer, I think a public employer, I think that would be a problem. Um, again, if you're friends with that person on Facebook or what other or one of those other crazy social media sites, and and you see it, that's fine. Or if somebody else shares it that you're friends with and you see it, that's fine. But don't try to get it indirectly in, in, in that kind of a secretive way. First of all, it doesn't pass the smell test, and perhaps it may not be lawful either, which it should be first of all. Um, the, um, so the, I had another thought. It was an amazing thought, and I lost it, um, about, uh, the, about searching, uh, being friends with others. I can't remember what it was. Sorry. I apologize. It happens. Um, so um, there's a case in your outline, Quan versus the city of Ontario. And this was a case I was referring to, although, I mean, it's a 2010 Supreme Court decision. Um, so, you know, it, for a case to go from a lawsuit in the federal district court to the Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court and get a decision, it's a good eight years or so, which hopefully is, explains why it involves pagers. <laughs> and. <laughs> Oh, let me get my pager out. But these pagers, were, these pagers were provided by the employer, but employees were allowed to use them for a limited personal use. And what happened was the employer decided that they had reason to do an audit to figure out if employees were, uh, part of it was, were they really working, like they said they were working, and part of it was also um, to find out what, you know, they had some inkling that perhaps they were being used improperly. And the employer, I'm not going to, you can read the facts, but the employer was very careful. They didn't just say to every employee, give me your pager, we're going to look at everything you put there for the last two or three years. They were very careful in how they started their investigation. They didn't go crazy over broad and say, let me see everything. And then when they had reason with specific employees to go farther, the specific employees were then had their our possibly private information checked further, and some people got ended up getting fired. They filed a Fourth Amendment search and seizure claim and lost because, again, the employer took a very careful step-by-step -step approach instead of the sledgehammer approach, which worked out well for the employer in that situation, even though we all know that it would be much nicer to take the sledgehammer approach and see where the chips fall, because this takes a lot longer. But I think that's the way you got to do it, especially when you're dealing with some of the social media stuff. One, a, a, a related comment that I want to make about social media and just the, the use of all of our devices is we all know, fortunately or unfortunately, how much easier it is to be burdened or permitted or thankfully allowed to work when we're not on the clock, whatever that means. And for employees who are not exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act, you are required to pay them anytime they are suffered or permitted to work. Suffered or permitted. Even means in situations when you told them you haven't given them permission to work, but they do it. The penalty or the the, the, if that happens, what the law expects you to do is pay them and discipline them. But there, so a lot, so unfortunately, these cases come up, whether social media related or not, these cases come up with, where somebody says, well, here's all my clock in times. I punched in, uh, you know, at, I punched in 15 minutes early every day. And my response is, my, the employer's response is, yeah, you might have done that, but you were sitting around reading the paper and drinking coffee or whatever. Okay, prove that. The employer has to prove that that employee did not work on June 21st, 2021, um, when they came in early, and that's near impossible. The other thing, and this came up in a case a couple years ago now, involving Chicago police officers, detectives, where they, they presented, they said, hey, 
I get emails during the night, I respond to these emails, I do a little research, anyway, so here's, I'm presenting to you all this time you owe me, and the employer said no, and they ended up prevailing part, in large part because, and this is the important takeaway, I think, is the employer had a specific policy requiring employees to report when they worked overtime and different ways of being able to report. So when the employee said, a year ago I did this, did you ever report it? No, and there was no credibility because, again, there was no evidence they did work or didn't work. So I think that in, in 2022 and going forward, that's something that you really is need to be careful about, making it clear to employees, not just that they can't work unless they're a lot, unless it's, there's an emergency or they're on the clock already, but if you do work outside your normal work hours, you must report overtime this way immediately, and immediately could be 24 or 48 hours. Yes? I'll go with the uh, hypothetically, can an employer have a policy that it is vital that employees be in the office from 8 to 4.30 to serve the public, therefore any uh, time served earlier or after work has to be pre-approved in order to have overtime. Absolutely. Until, until the employee violates that, works, uh, claim, works overtime, then you still have to pay that employee and discipline them for being insubordinate. So, and, and again, I've had clients who have done that, and I've also had clients who say, I don't want to go that route and discipline somebody who's truly doing more. But yes, you can have that policy, but you still can't avoid paying them absent, you know, on the discipline side of things. Any other questions or thoughts? All right. I just talked about the Quan case. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about personnel policies. And we've sort of floated in and out of personnel policies as we've talked about some of these things. And look, some of this is not going to be new to you. Uh, I, th I mean, I think you guys already do some of this stuff. Um, but, you know, first of all, what does your policy say about comp being able to use a computer that you own for personal use? Again, I'm not saying you have to have a policy that says you may go on ESPN.com no more than 42 seconds, you know, but, but again, you should have some guidance in your policy and then, and I know this is easier said than done, address deviations and violations of that policy. And when I say address them, if they're minor kind of violations, you address them by say, reminding the employee, not with discipline, but documenting that you have talked to the employee about it because that way, if they continue to do this stuff, it's less difficult to discipline. And frankly, those are great exhibits at the State Personnel Board of Review or in arbitration. Um, we tried. We, we gave them every chance. And, and of course, you know, my example of 42 seconds is kind of silly, but where do you draw the line? And, and, you know, the other thing is, of course, we want to treat different employees differently if it's justified because I'm not getting my work done, so you're going to hold my feet to the fire a little bit more than Christina. Great eyesight. Um, and, but, you know, how far can you go with that? So, um, so that's one thing. The other thing is in terms of your cell phones. Are you providing a cell phone to the employee? Are they using it for work? Um, um, are they using their personal cell phone for work? Again, all these different things have ramifications. I tell clients all the time, I am very thankful I don't have to carry two cell phones. But some people do, right, Chief? You got to two, your two cell phones. Which one's ringing? Um, and, you know, some, and that might be the solution. That's the way it happens sometimes. But here's the other thing to keep in mind. If you have employees who are using their personal cell phone for work-related stuff, you need to make it clear to them that stuff you do on that is pu potentially public record. Again, don't raise your hands. Oh, I saw that eyebrow go up. Don't raise hands, but, but you know, how many of us use our personal cell phone to text and about something other than, I'll meet you for lunch with another, co with a coworker? I mean, that stuff is potentially, is, most of it is probably public record. I mean, I, I had to change my habits, and I'm still way away, not nearly as good as I should be, when I came to Bexley City Law Director, because 
Now I have to worry about public records on my phone too because, you know, before I, um, as a private lawyer, only as a private lawyer, I didn't have to worry about that. So again, I'm not saying the sky's falling with this stuff, but I am saying that, that you probably should convey to employees that when they are texting um, the, uh, on, their, on their personal devices about something that's work-related, they should at least take a screenshot and save it someplace to be able to access it later um, because it, it happens all the time. Um, so there's a couple other things that are tangentially related with social media. Even social media posts could, could be public record um, it, depending on the situation. And again, everything, you know, just because it's public record, you know, doesn't mean they can't be destroyed. You have to, you can only destroy public records though consistent with your records retention schedule. How many of you knew you had a records retention schedule? And how many of you know where it is? Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's the other thing I discovered when I became law director about seven or eight years ago, that I am, by statute, a member of the Bexley Records Commission. Don't do as I do, do as I say. I'll just leave it at that. Um, so, and then, so in your policy, I think it's important to have examples of impermissible uses. And again, unlawful harassment, threats, solicitations, religious or political matters, partisan political matters. Um, Private business matters, chain letters, disseminating copyrighted material, unlawful discrimination, pornography, streaming media, playing games. Those are things that you, examples of things that you could say are automatically a no-no on any of device that you're providing. Um, and you should, you should give examples. I remember that thing I was going to say a few minutes ago. So again, you don't have to show hands, but how many of you are in HR or otherwise supervisors and you are friends in some face in some social media platform with your subordinates or other employees of your organization, because that is that is fine, but it also comes with ramifications. Because as you know, if you're as a supervisor or an HR, somebody comes to you and says, "I've been sexually harassed," you have to take action. You can't ignore that, even if the employee says, "I don't want you to do anything about it." The same is true if you see that on social media. If you have an employee who said, I had a terrible day, day at work, and Joe won't leave me alone, his hands are, whatever, you, you can't ignore that. You have got to look into that. And so I'm not saying do the, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil thing. I'm just saying that that is something to keep in mind if you are choose to follow or look at what some of your coworkers might do or subordinates on social media. The other thing that, from a practical standpoint, is man, there's things that people I'm good friends with, I don't want to see all this stuff. <laughs> but I do, because you can't, I can't look away. Um, so that's something else to, to, to be careful about. Um, although I really don't need to see anybody's meal. Uh, that's where I draw the line. Um, you also have to make it clear, should make it clear that you are, that employees cannot connect personal devices or download software on anything that you're providing. Um, uh, again, you know, I, I mentioned confidential, I don't think I did, confidential information. So, you know, there are, there are certain things that are, that are just no-brainers. Again, pornography, no-brainer. Disseminating confidential information is a no-brainer. And that is directly or indirectly. So you will see cases that come along from time to time where I'm taking a selfie of me and my buddy over here at work and the computer is showing on the back, behind me. I mean, again, I'm not saying you fire the person the first time they do that, but those are the kinds of things that we don't normally think about that are, um, that are important to keep in mind. You know, also the other thing that's important to keep in mind, whether it's your device or somebody else's device, is, um, is um, you know, how much time is being wasted at work and can you approve that as well? I mean, you can certainly prohibit employees from having their personal cell phone or their, you know, whatever device they have with them at work if you have reason to do so. Um, again, I know that's not totally practical, but that, that's something you can look at on a case-by-case -case basis. And, you know, um, again, making sure passwords, I think we're all better I don't even have password one as my password anymore, so I assume you folks are better than that. 
Um, but again, these are all things that need to be conveyed to employees that, you know, even if your computer's password protected, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, I would also strongly recommend that you have some sort of generalized, it doesn't have to be real specific, social media, social media policy. Um, so, uh, for example, um, you know, there's, there's some thoughts about that on page nine and um, about nine of the outline, but again, I think when you're talking a social media policy, things to remind employees is that they cannot, you know, you, you got to stay away from the broad policy. And again, in, in the public sector, we don't see this as much in the, as in the private sector. It's, you can't have a policy that says you cannot criticize the employer or any of your coworkers. And again, I understand, you know, from a First Amendment standpoint, that's a problem. It's also a problem, and I haven't seen any CERB cases on this, but the National Labor Relations Board, under federal law, federal collective bargaining law and state collective bargaining law, it, employees have the right to engage in concerted activity for their mutual benefit, with or without a union in the picture. So there have been, the National Labor Relations Board has set aside some po private employers' social media policy. They don't have to worry about First Amendment stuff, but, they, but what they have is, you know, this broad policy that says, thou shall not criticize anybody relating to, the, to this business. And that, in, in the NLRB's point of, from the NLRB's point of view, violates that ability to engage in concerted activity for the mutual benefit of you and your coworkers. Um, you know, and, and you should make clear that the policy applies when people are on duty and off duty. Because again, just because I'm off duty doesn't mean I can divulge confidential information. When I'm off duty, that doesn't mean that I can engage in conduct that would otherwise not be accepted while on duty, like sex, talking about how hot so-and-so looked at work today, or things like that. Now, again, that, that, that's all fair game for discipline. And the reason it is, is because and it's, there's a nexus to work. They, they, there's a connection to what you are, what that person is saying, and their job with you. All right, so here, here we got one. 38-year-old um, war veteran, James Kennedy, went on Twitter and complained about the low wages Chipotle paid to its crew members. Um, his tweet, Chipotle tweets, nothing is free, only cheap labor. Crew members make only $8.50 an hour. How much is that steak bowl, really? Um, he later de deleted the tweet um, and... Um, after a supervisor showed him the company's social media policy, um, and he can't, it, the policy says you can't make disparaging false statements about Chipotle publicly. Following another incident, he was asked to, he was fired. This is the example I just sort of gave. This is an actual example. You can't have a policy that says thou shalt not criticize. I might not like the criticism, and it might be different in a paramilitary organization to a certain degree, but even while off duty, you know, basically, I mean, I certainly can read this as saying that, you know what we need? We need some way for crew members to make more than $8.50 an hour. So, you know, I, to me, this, this was a, an overreach by that employer. And, you know, the other thing that's bizarre to me is who really gives, cares if, if I got an employee who's bitching about making $8.50 an hour? I mean, it's, it, it, the, the tweets aren't threatening. They're not dangerous. He's not saying, and who, me, I don't know, unless they pay me more, I might put, put something in your food, who knows? That would be a problem. But, but something like this, I mean, I, it just seems to be an overreaction and a, an inability to recognize the reality we're living in. Um, I'm not saying I'm, I mean, I'm guilty of that at times too, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to just disparage the Chipotle manager, but you know, the, I guess enough said. Any thoughts, questions? Only yes, please. Thank you. Can you talk about the phone being public records? If they take my phone, what are they looking for? Are they going to just find who in my phone is employees of the agency that I'm talking to? 
or is it everybody on my phone? So your personal phone, if I, I wasn't clear maybe, your personal phone itself is not public record. Your employer can't just say, let me see everything on your personal phone. But, but if a public records request comes in and says, provide me with all emails, tweet, uh, tweets, uh, te uh, texts, and other documents concerning the accident in Maine and Broad on April 25th. And you were in the field working on that, and you sent a tweet going back. What you would be, uh, if I'm your employer, I would say, as long as I trust you, check your phone, tell me if you have anything about that, and do a screen screenshot. I would try to avoid taking your phone. But to answer your question, no, I don't think the employer can say, and I'm going to look at everything else on your phone as well. I think they could look, in, your, in that case, on, on, on your, at your texts only. Anything else? All right. Um, so, you know, again, we talked a lot about this social media on duty. You know, it's different if it's the employer's devices versus the employee's devices. Um, unless you have questions, I'm not going to belabor that point, although perhaps I already have. Um, the um, um, same is true for the off-duty thing. Again, just because it's off-duty, if, if I'm carrying your phone, the employer-provided phone, you can still regulate my off-duty use of that phone just like I'm on duty. I mean, I know that may, may not be earth-shattering, but but again, even if I'm using it for some personal reasons from time to time, it's still more subject and easier to regulate in a work role or policy than it is if it's my own personal device. Um, so here's a good one. Um, so tell me what you do in this situation. You got a probationary employee start, starting tomorrow, and you discover that the day before they're starting, they insult, uh, they, they Go on social media and insult the job. This job really sucks. I'm not looking forward to it. Um, this happened to be a teenager, so but so upcoming first day, calling it a effing job. So you you find a you see this and you have a new employee starting tomorrow. What do you do with that? Anything? Would anybody? Would you ignore it? What would you do? What do you want? Oh, there's a hand. Thank you. Well, they haven't technically started yet. So, I mean, you telling them to not come to work is not going to, I don't think it would be any liability because they haven't, like, there's no paperwork that's gone through. They're not an employee. So, so your answer would be, you know what? We just saw this post, and we, we, we have rethought our decision. No, that wouldn't be my response. Okay, my response okay. Would be <laughs> so, so that, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put words in your mouth. Go ahead. No, what would it's you do? fine. I would just say uh, we no longer need to fill this position. Okay, okay. So, again, be careful about that, because what happens if you fill that position next week? Oh, we wouldn't. We would wait. <laughs> All right. I don't want you to reveal all your secrets. And, yeah, and change and change the title, change the the posting and the position slightly. Right. I mean, first of all, let's be clear. There's nothing in here that's protected by the First Amendment. I don't. You got one right next door. I think it would depend also on what the position is, because depending on like what they're, if it's just a, you know, somebody that's going to be a maintenance worker on the grounds, you know, their manual labor, you know, some people might agree with that sentiment. If it's something physical, if they have to be a custodian, something of that versus, you know, somebody that's in a higher level position and is posting and presenting themselves in that manner, you might need to consider whether they're the right person for that job. And I, and I think that's fair um, to treat it differently. Um, you, w would you talk to that person, though, and let them know you saw it? Yeah, I mean, I think at a minimum, saying, look, you're, you're entitled to have that opinion, but we expect you to do the job and do it well and diligently. And, you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, uh, a, learning, uh, a learning moment, a teaching moment for that person. Any other thoughts anyone wants to share on that? Yeah.
Oh, yeah, no, that's a great way to introduce them to social media policy. Yep, absolutely, I like that. That's um, very organic. Um, and, um, right, so, and of course, you know, we could change the, change the facts and change the, what, what was said to get it closer and closer to a First Amendment thing. Um, and, and, you know, so going back, and I don't mean to be picking on you because, but if, 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 it, if it's a, this situation, I'm perfectly fine with your answer. If it's a situation which might be bordering on First Amendment, I, I think the, the more honest you are, the better off you're going to be. Because later on, if you have to testify about why you really didn't hire that person, because they showed a terrible attitude. Uh, and again, you know, it, it's easy to change the facts on that. Like I said, based on those facts, I have no problem with your answer. Yeah? If you did hire this person, then would you take a screenshot of that and place it in their employee file? So when they turn now they're hired, you give them the policy so it doesn't need Further. Yeah, question was, if you do hire this person, would you take a screenshot of that and put in their personnel file? I'd sure keep it someplace. Absolutely. I think that's right. I think that's a good point. Um, we don't want any questions coming up later on. I didn't say that. Or whatever craziness might happen. Yeah. Offline that was recorded. And called off sick, did not realize that it was still recording and they didn't turn their phone off. This individual went on for 13 minutes and said about how he was drunker than, and disparaging comments about the workplace, about his personal life. And I don't believe the department took disciplinary action. I mean, he had sick time, he had the time to call off and they, I think they overlooked it, but I But he wasn't sick. <laughs> Well, maybe he was. Maybe he was. So, that is pretty funny. And actually, I guess that re makes me think that I need to, whatever, whatever there's got to be some way to make it less likely I butt call people. So, I. What had happened? He's like, oh shit, my phone was on. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful, because before you got there, I might have called him in and asked him why you called in sick and see if he'd lie. Because, you know, it is, as you folks know, it's really hard to discipline somebody for sick leave abuse. It's not impossible, but those are some things that you, look, when it comes to any of this stuff, you have the right to investigate any legitimate concerns you have about work rule violations, policy violations, inappropriate conduct, and the best time to do that is before you make a decision. And I know that sounds obvious, but that is one of the things that sometimes employers forget is, I can make you answer my questions within reason after jumping through some hoops. So, but yeah, that's beautiful. To follow up on the sick one, I had an uh, employee who posted on Facebook, well, she asked to go home sick. It was granted. It was a, um, her uh Co-workers uh, were like, you know, I don't really think she was sick. Uh, later that evening at 11, a, or 11 p.m., she was posting uh, that she was out playing pool and had all the photos and was just enjoying the night drinking. Um, that was, she left early because she was sick and then went out drinking and out in public. And so I did bring this to her attention because it's amazing how fast coworkers will turn in each other oh, when it's you post true. it on Facebook. That's right. That's why the comment I made earlier about if somebody comes to you with a, with a, hey, did you see this? No, can you print it off from me? Screenshot it or whatever. But that's always a tough situation too because, well, I wasn't scheduled to work at 11 o'clock at night even though we all know what's going on. Any other hands? This side of the room's been so quiet. All right, it's okay, you're allowed to. Um, all right. So um, there's some cases in your outline. Again, I'm not gonna belabor the point. Uh, you can read them about off-duty social media con conduct. Again, keeping in mind, I said this before, the question you're gonna have to answer when it comes to a discipline is what's the nexus to, between that off-duty conduct and the employee and your your mission as the employer and again it's going to depend on what they said 
um, what the context is, and it's also going to depend on what they do for your organization. You know, you're, we're told treat everyone the same, treat everyone the same, but th that's not always feasible or realistic to treat everyone the same. Um, is feasible and realistic are those synonyms? I think I'm just wasting time. Um, all right, so I want to come one last one last uh, craziness. So this is a website. Uh oh, I can't read it if I don't walk out of here. This is a uh, angry cops website, and this Buffalo police officer posted videos uh, to an account this, uh, on angry cops, which it ha appears to have a rotating cast of characters. Um, he appears in several videos in uniform. That's a big deal. And in one, he makes a joke about stealing cocaine from the evidence room. And then one reads, Idiots overdose when they're inside drug court. What the crap? Firefighter, cops, EMS, just say no, kids. Local reports allege that he broke the, the department's policy by wearing his uniform in some of the videos. So again, that's something else that you absolutely can have in your policy. No identifying um, markings of you in uniform is enough. There was a case many, many, many years ago, and some of you have probably heard me reference it, involving a city in Ohio um, where an officer ended up getting fired for posting nude pictures of himself on a website designed to attract people who are interested in seeing and meeting people who post nude pictures of themselves. So that officer was fired. Why was he fired? Because to make it clear that he was safe and he could be trusted, he held his badge from that police department in the picture. So as I've said before, and again, I know some of you have heard this, my law school, a law school professor gave advice for the first exam after somebody raised their hands, and his answer was, be smart, don't be dumb. And there's a lot of truth in that, in that answer. So, look, I appreciate it. We, you know, we barely touched the surface on some of this stuff. I've tried to highlight some of the issues that, and, and challenges that I know you have to deal with. As I said before, everything's on a case-by-case -case basis. I'll be around if you have questions. Appreciate your participation. Mark, if I could just grab in, we got a couple minutes left. One question that came up in our audio program earlier, and I know what our two people said then, but let me ask a question that I thought was a good one. If you're an employer interviewing somebody, do you have a right to ask for their passwords in order to check their social media? And what's your response to that? And how do My you handle response that? is, I don't think you do have the right to require them to reveal their social media history to you through getting their password. And I'm glad you mentioned that because there's some stuff in the outline about that. Um, because the other thing you have to be really careful about when you're, when you're vetting somebody through social media, which is okay to do, is that there are certain things that you can't ask me in an interview or take into consideration. And if you see that on my social media posts, I don't think, and, and, and you end up not hiring me, I'm gonna argue that you're not hiring me because I supported X candidate or whatever the case might be. Um, now, did I give a different answer than the person this morning? Well, no, this was in May. Oh, their, okay. their answer was, you don't have to give them the password, but then they don't have to hire you. Well, you know what? L legally, I could say that's okay, too. But um, there are some states that actually make it unlawful to do that. But again, there are so many things. If you do that, again, with the password or without the or just a general Google search, um, you, I would strongly recommend that whoever's doing that search not be the person who's making the ultimate decision to hire that person because, again, at least if you're doing it for someone else, you could weed out the things that you're not supposed to know about. Like, I've been arrested but never convicted. You're not supposed to refuse to hire me just based on arrests. And, you know, I could go on and on about that. So I'd be really careful about that. Well, I think we owe a big round of applause because as I predicted, he's a rock star. Thank you, Mark.